Hello again, everybody. We will talk here about the management of burns in a little bit more detail. Uh, if you haven't seen the introduction to burns, I would highly suggest watching that first as it gives a little bit more of a comprehensive overview uh, of burns and uh, how we diagnose them, how we uh, assess them, and uh, this is going to be focused more on uh, the management. All right, so uh, just the overview of general management, of course, we always uh, take into consideration the ABC specific consideration and Burns is going to be uh, assessing that they have uh, a, uh, a respiratory tract that is capable of conducting air. So we are concerned about laryngeal edema secondary to uh, inhalation of superheated air or, uh, or smoke. Uh, we're also concerned about constriction of their chest wall uh, due to full thickness circumferential burns. Supp uh, supplemental oxygen is always given to any patient who has uh, sustained significant burn. Uh, we want to establish venous access both for administering fluids and for getting blood for our laboratory workup. Uh, CBC, BMP, type and cross match are indicated in all patients. Carboxyhemoglobin, chest x-ray, EKG, and cardiac enzymes are going to be indicated for respiratory burn patients. Uh, EKG, cardiac enzymes uh, are going to be indicated in electrical burn patients. We'll begin fluid resuscitation based on the extent uh, and severity of the burns using usually the Parkland formula. And a fluid resuscitation is an addition to whatever maintenance fluids they need. We also insert a Foley catheter to check for uh, to check for myoglobin. That urinary myoglobin is going to be important, especially in electrical burn patients, but it can be important in anybody who sustained deep uh, burns. Uh, the Foley catheter is also important for monitoring the patient's urinary output, which is an indicator of uh, whether or not we are adequately uh, hydrating the patient. We'll also insert an NG tube that's indicated for patients who have sustained more than 20% uh, body area of second or third degree burns to prevent from ileus. And then, of course, burn care and pain control. So the ABCs is mostly focused on the airway and breathing here. And the establishment of a secure airway and proper ventilation is very important, especially in certain patients who may have sustained damage to the respiratory tract. So most burn patients will have a secure airway, especially if they have maybe just like burns to the legs or burns to the arms. However, if the burns are to uh, the face or the neck or the chest, uh, then that's going to raise suspicion for uh, possible respiratory damage. So certainly if there's a, uh, in a history of inhalation of superheated air uh, or a history of inhalation of uh, carbon monoxide or, uh, or smoke, then uh, that warrants uh, further investigation because these patients may have sustained respiratory damage. On physical exam, this can be noted by soot around the mouth or the nares, grayish or blackish uh, so-called carbonaceous sputum or singed nasal hairs, burns to the lower face or neck, Symptoms of strider, hoarseness, dyspnea, or persistent hypoxia, as noted on uh, pulse oximetry, uh, or full thickness circumferential burns to the chest wall. The edema that can ensue from this can be restrictive on the chest wall and hence reduce the ability to ventilate properly. Fiber optic bronchoscopy can be useful to see if there's any uh, damage to the airway. Uh, and also blood gases are useful uh, as sort of an endpoint to see if there's, uh, if there's any hypoxemia. All right, so all burn patients should be placed on supplemental oxygen. A nasal cannula is sufficient in the majority of burn patients. However, if the patient has suspected respiratory burns or they've been exposed to carbon monoxide, so usually thermal burns, uh, they're in a burning house or a burning car for some time, they should be placed on 100% oxygen via facial mask. And the reason for this is because if you have carbon monoxide on the blood, 100% oxygen is going to displace the carbon monoxide much faster than just being on a nasal cannula or room air, which they shouldn't be on. 
So 100% oxygen via facial mask is really important for patients uh, with respiratory burns uh, that we uh, suspect may have a, uh, an exposure to carbon monoxide. And of course, the supplemental oxygen is in any patient, um, even if they don't need intubation. So pulse oximetry should be monitored, and it's important to know that patients who have respiratory burns that have been exposed to fire, and it's the combustion product, which ultimately is carbon monoxide, can have a falsely elevated pulse oximetry. And uh, so it's important to get a carboxyhemoglobin level. And that carboxyhemoglobin level tells you how much carbon monoxide is on the blood, essentially. And so what you can do is you take that percent carboxyhemoglobin and subtract that from the measured uh, percent oxygen saturation. And that tells you your true oxygen saturation. So for instance, if you have a patient with 95% uh, oxygen saturation and they come back with a 9% carboxyhemoglobin, then they really have an 86% oxygen saturation. You can also use CO oximetry in the ED setting if it's available. This is also useful for measuring carboxyhemoglobin levels. Next, it's important to establish venous access. You're using large bore IVs here, and this is because in the majority of burn patients, of severe burn patients, uh, anything really over 15%, uh, second or third degree to the body area, 15% of the body area, we need to replenish fluids because there's going to be edema. And so we want to replace that fluid as quickly as possible. And so you'll use 16 gauge uh, IVs. And you're also going to establish venous access uh, because you need uh, to take blood for laboratory examination. So at this point, while the nurses are establishing venous access, usually here you've got some time. This is a good time to estimate the total body surface area that's been burnt, uh, as well as the depth of the areas burnt, how much our first degree, how much our second degree, how much our third degree, because this is going to dictate the rate of fluids you'll provide. When you say it's X amount of percent of surface area burnt, you're only considering second and third degree burns. We don't consider first degree burns for that. So it's only second and third degree burns. Because it's only second and third degree burns that can result in edema. As far as laboratory and diagnostic workup, what do you need to get on a burn patient? All burn patients should get CBC, BMP, type and cross match, and a touch screen. Electrical burn patients should get an EKG, cardiac enzymes, urine myoglobin, and a head CT if they had loss of consciousness. The urine myoglobin is important because with electrical burns, the damage that's sustained is usually much worse than it appears on the outside. Usually the inside damage is much worse than the outside appearing damage. And so we want to know if there is, and if so, to what extent muscle damage there is. Because when the muscle is damaged, it spills out myoglobin. Myoglobin is nephrotoxic. And so we want to know what the urine myoglobin is. With respiratory, uh, also with electrical burn patients, they're at risk for, uh, for arrhythmia, so we want to get an EKG on them as well. With respiratory burns, we want to get a carboxyhemoglobin because they were possibly exposed to carbon monoxide. We want to get a chest x-ray, arterial blood gases can be useful, cardiac enzymes, and an EKG. Um, so because of the possibility of myoglobinemia, you'll want to get serial BMPs, uh, to check for the uh, to check for any decline in the kidneys because there can be ensuing renal damage from that. So remember the kidneys, when, especially if you have an electrical burn patient or really any burn patient who's sustained possible injury to the muscle, and that can be any patient with third degree burns. Any other diagnostic tests should be done also at this time, depending on coexisting injuries. So if they fell, for instance, you might need to get x-ray of uh, the pelvis or the, the femur, etc. Fluid resuscitation. So this, we're going to do Parkland's formula here. And Parkland's formula is the percentage of, uh, it tells you how much, uh, this V is something we need to determine to know how much fluid we're going to give the patient. And this 
fluid is in addition to maintenance fluid. This is Ringer's lactate. We tend to use Ringer's lactate. That's preferred. But this fluid is in addition to maintenance fluid. So this isn't the total fluid that we give the patient. Uh, the patient is also going to be getting maintenance fluid, or if they can take oral fluid, then oral fluid. But uh, uh, this is additional fluid. We give additional fluid to any patient who has sustained burns to more than second or third degree burns to more than 15% of their body area. So the formula is that the volume equals the percentage of body area burned times the patient's weight in kilograms times 4 milliliters per kilogram uh, of Ringer's lactate. So, uh, th and the 4 milliliters of kilo uh, per kilogram is for adults. For children, we're going to use 6 milliliters per kilogram. All right, so uh, percentage body area burned times kilogram weight times 4 milliliters kilogram in adult, 6 milliliters per kilogram in children. And this is Ringer's lactate in addition to maintenance fluid. Some patients will need maintenance fluid. For instance, if, they're, uh, if, if they, they have an NG tube, uh, which is going to be all patients with more than 20% of their body area burnt, um, or patients who are just too sedated to where they can't orally take fluids. But uh, patients who can take sufficient oral fluids, then they don't need to be on maintenance fluids. But they still do need to be on the Ringer's lactate to replenish their, uh, their fluids that they're going to uh, third space from the burn. Okay, so next we also want to insert a Foley catheter. So the Foley catheter is inserted for two reasons. One, we want to monitor the urinary output, and that ensures that we have adequate hydration. So we do that by measuring the amount of urine that the patient is putting out. Half to one milliliter per kilogram per hour is adequate urinary output in an adult. For children, it's at least one milliliter per kilogram per hour. We also want to get a Foley catheter placed because we need a urinary sample, and that urine sample is going to tell us if there's myoglobin in the urine, which is an indication that the kidneys are at risk. In the rare event of a burn to the genitalia, which uh, would preclude putting in a Foley catheter, you can put in a suprapubic catheter. You'll also want to put in an NG tube. And this is going to be, I should have put it on here, this is for patients who have burns, second or third degree burns, to more than 20% of their body. The problem is patients who have burned to more than 20% to 30, uh, 20 of their body are going to develop an ileus. And we want to prevent that or minimize it uh, as much as we can. So... Uh, to mitigate the ileus, we place the NG tube to decompress the GI system. The patient will also be NPO, so these patients will also need to be on maintenance fluids in addition to their fluids, uh, Ringer's lactate that they needed based on the Parkland's formula. For burn care, what do we do? So now topically, we're thinking about the burn itself. How do we treat this? Typically, for second and third degree burns, if there is no S-char present, we're going to use silver sulfadiazine. And this is anywhere really but the face. So for general management of second degree burns or third degree burns with no S-char present, we use silver sulfadiazine. If there is S-char present, then we can use maconide acetate. We want to use this sparingly, however. For patients who have burns to the face, we use a triple antibiotic ointment. And the triple antibiotic ointment is just consists of bacitracin, neomycin, and polymyxin B. So uh, burns to the face, we use triple antibiotic ointment. Burns with no eschar, we use sulfa sulfa silver sulfadiazine. And for burns with eschar present, this penetrates a little bit better, gets through the eschar, we'll use maphenide acetate. For pain control, Typically, patients with uh, significant burns, more than 15%, who need to be hospitalized, they're going to require IV opiates. Uh, and so those are indicated for patients with severe burns. This can ultimately be transitioned to oral opiates and or to NSAIDs. Patients who have first or second degree burns, 
who are managed on an outpatient setting can be discharged with NSAIDs or oral opiates. So you really just want to titrate this to the uh, minimum amount to control pain. Uh, IV opiates if necessary, uh, but otherwise you can use oral opiates or NSAIDs. Of course, if you're using an oral medication, the patient can't be NPO. So that's an important fact as well as you probably imagine. So the general admission orders. Patients who have significant second and third degree burns should be promptly admitted to a burn center if possible. They tend to fare better if they're in a specialized setting. Other aggravating factors that can warrant admission to a burn center include significant burns to the face, perineum, eyes, ears, hands, or feet. These are areas that if they're not managed properly uh, surgically, it can result in significant morbidity and reduction in quality of life, uh, uh, deformity, etc. So these areas need special care. Patients with circumferential burns, these patients are at risk for developing a sort of compartment syndrome because of the edema that develops within the cavity, uh, within the, the arm or leg or chest. Uh, they can get... Uh, the circulation can get cut off, the nerves can get compressed, the patient may not be able to breathe properly. And so patients who have circumferential burns should be admitted to a burn center also. Uh, a couple things with circumferential burns. If you can't get the patient into a burn center, one thing you're going to want to do is something called an escarotomy. And all you're doing here is you're making an incision down the escar and you don't need to use any kind of, uh, of anesthesia because, remember, with third-degree burns, you don't have any you don't have any pain response to that. It's painless, senseless. So uh, you can do that escarotomy. Also important to do with any patient with circumferential burns, specifically in the fingers or wrists is to remove any kind of jewelry or other articles because the edema is going to swell worse and worse. And so you want to remove that as quickly as possible because if you have a ring on, for instance, that can eventually cut off circulation uh, to, the, uh, to the distal extremity. So rings, bracelets, and watches should be removed uh, promptly. Patients who have electrical burns should always be admitted to a burn center if possible. Very young or very old... Older patients should be admitted to a burn center because they tend to do a little bit worse than patients in between those periods, so less than five years of age or more than 55 years of age. And of course, any patient with significant comorbidities, especially those that can affect the healing of the burn site, so we're thinking here of diabetes mellitus, HIV, patients with renal failure, or uh, pulmonary or vascular disease. Patients uh, who have burns of more than 20% of their body should be placed on an NG tube and they should be NPO for one to two days and put on maintenance fluids and this helps prevent that ileus. After uh, burn fluids are done being administered, so by burn fluids I mean those fluids that are administered for the first two days that we derive from Parkland's formula, the patient can then uh, be placed on a high calorie diet and after you develop burns, when you've been burnt for some time after that, because your body is in such a healing state, you are in a hypermetabolic state, and so you'll need to be on a high-calorie diet. And this can be, you should just be aware of that, this can be done uh, with the nutrition department. They'll know how to take care of these patients as far as their diet is concerned. For outpatient management, a lot of patients will sustain burns that don't require hospitalization. So outpatient management can be undertaken in patients whose burns cover no more than 10% of their surface area. Remember, we're talking about second and third degree burns here. And that's uh, reduced to 5%, no more than 5% in children uh, and the elderly. And notably, the patients can't have any third degree burns. So if the patient has third degree burns, there's escar present anywhere, they're going into the hospital. So if it's first degree burns or second, de uh, or second degree burns to less than 10% for adults or less than 5% of their body to children or elderly, then they can be managed outpatiently. What you're going to do is you're going to disinfect, dress, and manage their pain. That's the basis of outpatient burn management. So for first degree burns, 
Uh, th these can be managed by just applying a non-adherent dressing uh, and management of pain with NSAIDs. Okay, so pr pretty easy. With second degree burns, we're concerned a little bit more about infection because of the uh, because you've separated your uh, dermis from your hypodermis, and so you're a little bit uh, a little bit more susceptible to infection. Uh, so we need to apply some kind of treatment uh, that will ward off infective bacteria. So what we're going to do is if there uh, are if there's any closed blisters, so blisters that have not opened, uh, you can leave them as is. And any open blisters, you should remove any uh, existing skin on the top. So remove that roof of the blister. Excuse me. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so if there's open blisters, you can take off that remaining skin. If the blister, though, is closed, leave it. And what you're going to do is apply silver sulfadiazine or triple antibiotic ointment to the burn. And, of course, it's silver sulfadiazine if it's anywhere other than the face. Triple antibiotic ointment is applies, applied to the burns on the face. What you'll then do is wrap the burn in dressing, and the patient should change the dressing daily. If they're outpatient, you can manage the pain with NSAIDs. The patient should be instructed to return if, the, if they develop a fever or if there's a worsening of the erythema uh, on, their, uh, uh, on their burn site or if uh, the pain worsens. Uh, and the reason for that is that this indicates a possible infection. Uh, and so infections can be treated, uh, this is just cellulitis, and so we can treat this with either an anti-staph penicillin or a first-generation cephalosporin, as we would treat any cellulitis. In certain patients who have difficulty healing, inpatient observation may be advisable even for small burns. So even for uh, an elderly person who has 3% of body area burnt, uh, they, it, may be, uh, it may be warranted to uh, observe them in the hospital uh, overnight uh, just to make sure that uh, nothing's uh, that they're healing properly. So just keep in mind these aren't perfect rules here. Uh, there is always going to be a population that's an exception. And so as far as if you decide to manage a patient on an outpatient basis, uh, they should be able to heal properly. So patients with diabetes or other comorbid conditions you may want to hospitalize them for observation. Some special management for non-thermal burns. So a chemical burn. When a patient has sustained a chemical burn, the very first thing that they need to do as soon as possible is irrigate the burn. Irrigate the, uh, the, the site of chemical exposure with tap water. You're not using anything other than tap water. And by irrigate, I mean just something as simple as running it under a faucet. And you want to do this as soon as possible. And this should be done for at least 20 or 30 minutes. Important to know, do not play chemist and try to neutralize the burn. So if they have been, if they spilled hydrochloric acid on their hand, don't go and pour bleach on their hand. And if they've been exposed to Drano, don't go and pour vinegar on their hand. The reason you don't want to do that is because what kind of reaction is that? It's a exothermic reaction. It releases heat, and that heat that it releases can give you a thermal burn, and that can make things worse. So hopefully my general chemistry was right there. But uh, yeah, you, that's why you don't want to neutralize the burn, because it's going to release heat, and that will make it worse. So once you've irrigated with tap water, then after that there are various agents that can be used to remove any remaining acid or alkali, but this really depends on the particular offending chemical. So uh, for instance, if the patient was, uh, was exposed to uh, phenol, you can use polyethylglutamate, PG, I think that's what it stands for, PEG. Uh, if they've been exposed to uh, I think hydrochloric acid and uh, hydrofluoric acid, uh, you, can, uh, you can give them 
calcium gluconate in a, uh, a jelly. So you'll just use like a petroleum jelly and uh, it's like a powder that you put in a calcium gluconate powder and put that on top. So there's various things that you can do topically for chemical burns. But what you do, all you need to know really for the USMLE is that with chemical burns, the very, very first step is copious irrigation with tap water. Do not try to neutralize the burn. Electrical burns, as I've mentioned before, you should be very aware uh, that there is arrhythmogenic complications of electrical exposure, and so an EKG is absolutely mandatory.